Today we're in Genesis chapter 35, and we're going to take a look at Jacob's return to Bethel. So let's begin now at verse 1 of Genesis chapter 35, how God spoke to Jacob, calling him back to Bethel. Here we go, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Previously in the book of Genesis, we saw the crisis and the massacre at the city of Shechem. That was just in the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 34. That great crisis and the terrible massacre happened because Jacob went to Shechem instead of Bethel, where God had apparently called him to go. I take that based on Genesis chapter 31, verse 13, uh, where it doesn't exactly say that God told Jacob to go to Bethel, but I, I believe it implies it. But now, at last, after the crisis, after the massacre at Shechem, after the disgrace at Shechem, then Jacob finally went to Bethel. You could say that the whole experience at Shechem was a example of the power of a worldly, ungodly influence upon Jacob and his family. Now Jacob will separate from that and go to the place God called him to go to originally, Bethel. I like what Donald Gray Barnhouse said about this. He said this, quote, The only cure for worldliness is to separate from it. Jacob had to leave Shechem to go to Bethel. There had to be a departure from one place and a new direction and destination set for him. There was a new place for Jacob and his family to dwell, and it was at Bethel, the house of God. In Genesis chapter 34, that sordid chapter, it does not mention God once. You could say that it's one of the most shameful chapters in the history of Israel's patriarchs. But Genesis chapter 35 mentions God more than 10 times, plus 11 more times in the names of places such as Bethel and Israel, the name Israel. This reflects a renewed focus on God here in Genesis chapter 35. And God told Jacob to go to Bethel and there to make an altar there to God, reading from verse 1. You see, Jacob was told to go back to Bethel and resume a life of worship there. That's what altars were all about. A place of sacrifice, a place of honoring God, a place of worshiping God. This demonstrable return to the Lord would have an especially good effect on the children of Jacob. You know, they were wild and out of control back in Genesis chapter 34 with the whole Shechem incident. Now we're going to see an improvement, at least somewhat, in the near term, in their character. The best thing that parents can do for their children is to choose God's path for themselves to lead by example. You know, I think of it sometimes about how Jacob could have looked back on his walk with God. The first meeting that he had with God at Bethel must have seemed like a high point in his spiritual experience. That's way back in Genesis chapter 28. But to his credit, Jacob refused to think that the best years of his life were God, with God were behind him. Instead, now he's returning to his first love. He's returning to Bethel, and God blessed it. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about this. Let me read you a quote from Spurgeon. He said this, quote, A revival of old memories is often most useful to us, especially to revive the memory of our conversion, the memory of the love of our espousals when we first went after the Lord into the wilderness and were quite satisfied to be denied and disowned from everybody so long as we might but dwell near to him. That memory is right good for us. So now, beginning at verse 2, we're going to see the good effect that this has on Jacob's family, at least in the near term, with them cleansing themselves, putting away idols. Look here now at verse 2. We read, 
And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. It's remarkable that Jacob, as the patriarch of his family, had to say to his family, as he says in verse 2, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves. You see, Jacob's family only got right with God after Jacob himself did. This again shows us the tremendous leadership role men have within the family. A man resisting God will see the same effect at work among his children. But a man who gets right with God will see the positive effect in his family. It's very interesting that Jacob's children actually kept foreign gods among them. Maybe some of this was from the bad example they received from Rachel. Rachel kept the household idols of her father. We saw this back in Genesis chapter 31, verse 19. They were simply following the example of one of the parents in the family. You know, it's true, no matter how hard we try to teach our children godly conduct, they're going to continue to do what we do. They're going to follow the life example of the parents. Hey, parents, the best thing that you can do for your children, if you want them to grow up godly and believing, is for you yourself to live a godly and believing life. But, you know, I also want you to consider that it was not only from Rachel that they received this influence to gather foreign gods among themselves, but they had been living among, or at least very close to, the Canaanites. We saw that in Genesis chapter 34. And the Canaanites were a very idolatrous people. It would be surprising if that influence did not rub off on the children of Israel. So both from the bad example from their mother, Rachel, and and then both from the influence from the Canaanites that they lived around, they gathered these idols among them, and now came the time to decisively put them away. Believer, I hope you've come to that point in your life where you're going to put away idolatrous things. You're going to put away things that separate you from a daily life of fellowship and engagement with God. That where the Holy Spirit pricks your conscience and tells you, you need to get right with God about this, that you will in fact do this. That is what the children of Jacob did after Jacob himself set the example, and then he commanded his own family, put away the foreign idols. But that's not all he did. He also told them in verse 2, and change your garments. This was also an important step, both literally and as a symbol of spiritual renewal. Jacob wanted them to be cleaned up and in their best frame of mind to come before the God they had neglected returning to him at Bethel. You know, throughout the Bible, garments symbolize character or the way that we live. The inward life of an unregenerate person is sometimes compared to a polluted garment. We see this in the book of Jude, verse 23. It says this, But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And then Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 22, gives a similar exhortation. It says that you Put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on, and that's referring to like putting on a garment, the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So take off the garments associated with impurity and ungodliness and put on the garments associated with obedience and holiness before the Lord. We also see in verse 4 that they put away the earrings which were in their ears. 
Apparently, these earrings had a pagan connection. Though someone could find a justification for keeping the earrings, they got rid of them, nevertheless. That was very good. You see, they had a pagan connection with those earrings. And they could say, well, it's just decoration. Well, it's just fashion. Well, it's just something I like. But they realized, no, this has a pagan association with it. This is a season of great purity and holiness in my life. I'm going back to Bethel. I need to get this right in my life. It's important for every one of us to take stock of what we may have in our home or among our person that's ungodly or connected to the occult or impure in any way, and we should promptly get rid of those things. Now, this is what happens next here in Genesis chapter 35, starting out verse 5. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. I find it fascinating that as they left Shechem and journeyed towards Bethel, God protected them. Did you see that in verse 5? Here's the phrase. The terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. This was God's protection on Jacob and his family. Now, it would have been fair of God to leave Jacob to the consequences of his sinful lack of leadership over his family at Shechem. Again, that's back in Genesis chapter 34. Yet God's grace covered Jacob and his family even when their sin had made them vulnerable. I mean, let me remind you that Jacob and his family needed this protection because the massacre at Shechem made them hated among the Canaanites, as Jacob feared at the end of Genesis chapter 34. But God protected them, and they journeyed southward towards El Bethel. And then it says in verse 7, he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Though Jacob had sinned, he now did what was right before God. He did this despite any danger, and he chose to trust in God's protection. God might, excuse me, Jacob might have justified a lack of obedience because of fear, but instead he trusted God, and God protected him and brought him to Bethel. Let me read you another quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says this about their coming to Bethel. They came to Bethel, and I can almost picture the grateful delight of Jacob as he looked upon those great stones among which he had laid him down to sleep, a lonely man. Perhaps he hunted out the stone that had been his pillow. Probably it still stood erect as part of the pillow which he had reared in memory of the goodness of God and the vision he had seen. There were many regrets, many confessions, many thanksgivings at Bethel. You see, I like that quote from Spurgeon because it reminds us that Jacob was returning to a place where he had had a profound experience with God, as recorded in Genesis chapter 28, more than 20 years before. And here, he was returning to his first love. This was a season of revival in Jacob's life where he was returning to the first things. You know, it was dangerous for Jacob to set out for Bethel. He was taking a risk and relying on God's protection. But you know what was even more dangerous? It was even more dangerous for him to disobey God and not do what God told him to do. The only thing that could save Jacob at this critical moment was a radical obedience to the Lord. Friends, no matter what the circumstances look like, the safest thing for a believer to do is to obey the will of God. Now, verse 8. Now, Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel 
under the terebinth tree, so the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. Now Deborah, this was Rebecca's nurse, Rebecca, the mother of Jacob. Now, we know nothing of this woman before this account. Seemingly, she came with Rebecca as a companion when she came from Haran to marry Isaac. And obviously, she was a beloved member of the family because they named the place where she was buried Alon Bakuth, which means Oak of Weeping. And this was Rebecca's nurse. Now, again, some commentators assume for some reason that she came to be in Jacob's household coming from his mother's household. But we don't know for certain if this was the case. Let me continue on now, starting at verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. Verse 9 tells us, then God appeared to Jacob again. And it also tells us that God blessed Jacob. You know, when Jacob finally arrived at the place God told him to go, that was Bethel, he immediately found blessing. God appeared to him. God blessed him. And I love it how God called him by his new name, Israel. You know, this is a reminder that the new name, remember back in Genesis chapter 32, God told Jacob, your name shall be Israel. And that new name was important because Jacob had acted like the old Jacob instead of the new Israel. Yet God wanted to set his mind on the new man God had made him to be. God does the same with the believer today. He wants to remind us of who we are in Him. God wants His people to remember and live in the great names that He gives to us. Now, friends, I know that the book of Revelation says that God will give to His people a new name. Praise the Lord for that. But I want you to know that if you are in Christ Jesus, God has given you names now. He's given you a new name as a son or a daughter of God. He's called you a new name that you are a priest and a king unto him. You are adopted into his family. You are an heir of his kingdom. You are a co-laborer with Christ. These are all great names that God gives you as a man or a woman who is now believing in the Lord and following him. That's why in verse 10, when God says, Israel shall be your name. This was a mighty confirmation of what God said before. I wonder if sometimes Jacob thought, God, that new name you gave me, Israel, which means prince with God, most likely. Uh, maybe you've took that name back. <laughs> you know, I, I was disobedient. I didn't go to Bethel when I should have. I went to Shechem. I let my family fall under ungodly influence. I endangered everything. Maybe you took away that new name, but now back at Bethel, God says so gloriously in verse 10, Israel shall be your name. And it was there, verse 9 says, that God appeared to Jacob again. Friends, I see this as a beautiful and powerful restoral of relationship. This was an excellent example of what it means to return to the believer's first love. 
You know, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, when God speaks to the church of Ephesus, he gives them a way to return to their first love. And it's marked by three things, remembering, repenting, and doing the first works. Well, Jacob remembered to go back to Bethel. Jacob repented by getting rid of all the idols and by changing the garments. And Jacob did the first works by building an altar and worshiping God as before. Yes, what God would detail uh, hundreds of years later in the book of Revelation chapter 2, that remembering, repenting, and doing the first works again, here Jacob does as a pattern when he gets back right with God in Genesis chapter 35. And as a beautiful part of this promise, in verse 12, God renews the covenant. He says this, Genesis chapter 35 verse 12, The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and to your descendants after you, I give this land. God granted Jacob a valuable reminder of his place in God's great covenant. That covenant began with his grandfather Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. And then it continued with his father Isaac. But now it's going on through the grandson Jacob. And in this, Jacob didn't need to hear anything new from God. God had already spoke this to him. But he simply needed to be reminded of what was true and to be encouraged to cling to it all. Friends, so much of our walk with God is exactly the same way. God gives us so many blessings in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, we are seated with him in heavenly places and we have all blessings in Christ Jesus. We just need to be encouraged to cling to those things and to set our eyes on those things. That's what Jacob was doing and God does a similar work with believers who draw near to him today. Now verse 13 says, Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. That phrasing in verse 13 makes me think that it's possible that God appeared to Jacob here in some bodily form. I mean, let me read that to you again in verse 13. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. It seems, now again, I want to be clear, the text doesn't say this exactly, but there's a sense of this in the text that God spoke to Jacob in some bodily form. This was part of the great blessing that God gave to Jacob after his return to his first love. Friends, much blessing waits for the believer when they finally do what God tells them to do. And in response, verse 14 says that at the altar that Jacob built, Verse 14, he poured out a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. Appropriately, Jacob performed sacrificial acts of worship to the God who had so greatly blessed him. You know, verse 14 mentions a drink offering, and the idea of a drink offering is found several places in the Bible. In Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, uh, those passages show that the drink offering was made with wine that was poured out in sacrifice before the Lord at his altar. Later on in the New Testament, Paul considered the pouring out of his life before God to be like the pouring out of a drink offering before God's altar. He mentions that in Philippians chapter 2 and in 2 Timothy chapter 4. See, what I love about this is that the heart of worship in Jacob showed gratitude towards God. You know, when believers look back on life, they should never have a sour, ungrateful attitude. I was robbed. I was cheated. Look how badly I was treated. Instead, the people of God should say, God is blessed. And this will probably determine if a believer will be perfectly miserable or perfectly delightful as they grow older. Now, I find it interesting that in the previous verses, God told Jacob to be fruitful and multiply. 
And what I think is very interesting is that at this point, Jacob already had 11 sons and one daughter. Why would God tell them to be fruitful and multiply? I think there's at least two reasons for this. Number one, God told him to be fruitful and multiply because he wanted to encourage Jacob to encourage his sons to have many children. God was going to bring a great nation out of these sons of Jacob, these sons of Israel. So they were to be encouraged to have many children. But there's another reason as well. God was not done giving Jacob children. He had had 11 sons and one daughter to this point, but there would still be one more son born. And that's what we come to here in Genesis chapter 35, verse 16, which reads like this. Then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. You know, we studied in previous chapters the great baby race that happened among Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah, their handmaids. And what a contentious rivalry, competition it was. We don't have a sense of any of this here. All we hear is that Jacob was not done having sons, and his beloved wife, Rachel, who her herself had only borne one previous son, that was Joseph. Now verse 16 says, Rachel labored in childbirth. And here, there seems to be none of the contentiousness and rivalry surrounding the birth of Jacob's last son. Maybe they were just all older by this time. Maybe it was now because they were in the promised land and the competition just didn't seem as important as it was before. But the promise was given. Verse 17, you will have this son, even though the birth itself was very difficult. It's possible that this last child was conceived at this place where Jacob came back to his first love for the Lord. After all, it was here that God told him to be fruitful and multiply. Now, verse 18, this tragedy. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. This is the very tragic death of the beloved wife, Rachel. She died in childbirth, and before she died, she called the name of this son Ben-Oni. Now, previously, the birth of a son to Jacob was seen as a victory for the wife who bore the son, a victory in the rivalry over her sister. Every son was a cause for rejoicing and victory in the competition with her rival. It was not so with this last son, and Rachel named him Ben-Oni, meaning son of my sorrow. You know, ultimately, this shows the futility of Rachel's rivalry with her sister Leah. Now, at the time of her final victory, who has the last laugh? Who bears the last son? It's me, Rachel. But all she finds is sorrow. Sorrow at her own death, of course. But she names the son Ben-Oni, son of my sorrow. But verse 18 also tells us his father called him Benjamin. Jacob wisely changed the name of the child to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Perhaps he rightly sensed the special place God had for this child. Or perhaps he simply prized Benjamin so greatly that he was the final link between himself and this woman that he most loved, his dear wife, Rachel. But he was named Benjamin, son of my right hand. 
You know, the right side was associated with greater strength and honor because most people are right-handed. Benjamin, son of my right hand, therefore has the idea of son of my strength or son of my honor. We find that idea expressed in passages like Exodus chapter 15, verse 6, which says this, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. You know, the Lord is our strength and honor. Psalm 16, verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. It's also wonderful to understand that God's strength and honor are for us. Psalm 63, verse 8 says, My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. You see, not only do I need to be upheld, I need to be upheld by God's right hand. And Psalm 138, verse 7 says this, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. <laughs> it's as if the psalmist says, and God's people can say collectively together, Lord, I need you to save me. And for this one, please use your right hand. I need your strength. I need your skill. By the way, Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father, that position of strength and honor, and we sit there with him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says this, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Well, after Rachel's tragic death, we're going to see now in verse 19 that she's going to be buried. Verse 19, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Rachel died and was buried. Her death was a tragic fulfillment of the curse that Jacob himself pronounced on the one who stole the idols of Laban. You know, Laban said in Genesis chapter 31, he put a death curse on the person who stole his idols. And Rachel was actually the one who did it, even though she was able to cleverly conceal it at the time. Yet, unavoidably, this curse came upon her and she tragically died in childbirth. I find it interesting that in Genesis chapter 30, verse 1, Rachel pleaded with Jacob, give me children or else I die. As it happened, both became true. She had children, plural, Joseph and Benjamin, and she died as a result. In honor to this great woman, verse 20 says that Jacob set a pillar on her grave. This reflects the great sorrow Jacob had in the death of his favored wife and companion. He wanted to memorialize her and his relationship with her. Jacob returned to right relationship with God at Bethel, but this did not insulate him from all sorrow and difficulty. You know, friends, sometimes people think that uh, if they get right with God, if they return to God, if they remember, if they repent, if they do the first things, again, if they do those things which God wants them to do, that everything's going to be smooth and easy in their life. Friends, don't be deceived by that. This does not insulate us from the normal and the difficult problems in life. But close to the Lord, we have the resources to endure, to triumph, to grow, to be blessed, even in the midst of such difficult times. Starting now at verse 21, here's another sordid incident here. Verse 21. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard about it. Reuben was the firstborn. We might expect better conduct from him, and we might expect him to receive the covenant of his fathers most seriously. 
I mean, think about it. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Only one of them received the covenant. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Only one of them received the covenant. There is no automatic assurance at this point that more than one son would receive the covenant. And the most logical choice would be Reuben, the firstborn. But here, Reuben sinned in a most offensive way against his father and his entire family by having sexual relations with his father's concubine. You know, in the larger picture, maybe it isn't a surprise that Reuben sinned so offensively. He grew up in a home filled with strife, contention, competition, and the pursuit of the flesh. Maybe it was almost to be expected. But Israel, his father, heard about it. Though there was a disgraceful sin, when Israel heard about it, he must have been crestfallen. Think about it. Simeon and Levi seem to disqualify themselves from the high calling of Abraham's blessing back in Genesis chapter 34 when they engineered the terrible massacre at Shechem. Now in Genesis chapter 35, Reuben seems to disqualify himself from the high calling of Abraham's blessing. The first three born sons, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, those were the three eldest sons of Jacob's twelve sons, they seem to disqualify themselves. God's going to do something special through the fourth son, Judah, even though he is going to have his own problems, as we'll see in later chapters. Now, let me begin in the middle of verse 22 with this listing of Jacob's 12 sons. We read, Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram. Now, as demonstrated in the previous chapters, these sons were not a collection of amazing spiritual men. Not at all. These were sons of Jacob. Friends, this was a severely dysfunctional family. And God was going to use this family, but not because they were so great, not because they were such spiritual men. He chose them and he used them by his grace alone. Well, let's continue on now to verse 27. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Kind of ironic. More than 20 years previously, Isaac called Esau to himself and said, I think I'm going to die. Let me bestow a blessing on you. And then Jacob came in and deceptively stole the blessing and that put into contact the whole fleeing of Jacob to the east, to Haran, and, and the story unfolds. But friends, Isaac thought he was going to die more than 20 years previously. And now he, he's finally very near to his death. You see, more than 20 years before this, Jacob left his home thinking his father would soon die. Jacob probably never expected to see his father again. And there seemed to be nothing dramatic here between Isaac and Jacob at this meeting. There are recorded no further words or blessings. Maybe Isaac was hindered by his old age and non-communicative. But he died, as it says here in verse 28. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. These formerly estranged brothers had already been brought together by God's hand. Now they worked together again, united by the death of their father. 
This ends Genesis chapter 35. Before we leave the chapter, let's think of some ways that Genesis chapter 35 points to Jesus. Uh, by the way, as you're listening to this or watching this, maybe you'll have some additional ways that you see Genesis chapter 35 pointing to Jesus Christ. We love to look at the Old Testament and look for the ways that it points to Jesus and indicates uh, something about him or points to him in some way. And these few ways that I give you now at the end, I'm not trying to say it's exhaustive. If you think of more ways, then leave it in a comment or send it in an email. We'd love to hear it. But here, in Genesis chapter 35, I see a few ways. First of all, there's a lot of death in this chapter. Verse 8 is the death of Deborah, Rebekah's nurse. Uh, verse 19 is the death of Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife. And verse 28 is the death of Isaac, the great patriarch. Look, when we see a lot of death going down, it reminds us that Jesus Christ overcomes death and that he's conquered death. What a glorious truth for believers in Jesus Christ. Secondly, I want you to think about Benjamin's original name. Before she died, Rachel named him Ben-Oni, son of my sorrow. Well, Jesus was the man of sorrows. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 says that Jesus is the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But Jacob changed Ben-Oni to Benjamin, son of my right hand. So not only is Jesus the man of sorrows, Ben-Oni, but he's also the man of God's right hand. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father on high. So we find Jesus uh, pointed to, indicated by both names given to Benjamin, Ben-Oni, son of sorrow, and Benjamin, son of the right hand. And then finally, that name Bethel, this place where Jacob returned to God in this season of revival in his life. That means house of God. And Jesus is building God's house in and among his people right now. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says this, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Friends, what a beautiful, powerful thing. We are God's spiritual house. Jesus is building us, his people up, as the house of God. I hope you're numbered among the people of God and that truly you are in that household of God that Jesus Christ is building. So three ways we see it here. If you think of more, please uh, let us know. Let me conclude now with prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for this beautiful example of Jacob returning to his first love. Uh, Jacob returning to a season of revival in his life. Lord, I pray that for everyone who hears this or watches this, that you would move deeply and powerfully in their life. And, Lord, restore them to fresh relationship with you. Uh, renew them. Restore them. Let us walk in the power of your blessings and your goodness, remembering where we've fallen from, repenting and doing the first works over again, and drawing near to you as you invite us to do. Let us do that, Lord, and bring you honor and glory as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.